Welcome everybody. The following workshop has been created as an introduction to mental health. What is it and how can we tell if our mental health might be declining and where can we go for support? Today's workshop is going to cover mental health by the numbers, mental health and mental illness definitions, mental health dual continuum, mental health continuum tool, and self-care strategies. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada in 2020, one in three Canadians will be affected by mental illness during their lifetime. Since COVID-19, Canadian youth aged 15 to 25 years are the least likely to report excellent to very good mental health. Since the pandemic, only 40% reported excellent to very good mental health, which is 20% down from pre-COVID. Let's highlight important stats from Alberta post-secondary students as they have reported experiencing the following within the last 12 months which is 49.7% felt so depressed that it was difficult to function. 68.9% felt overwhelming anxiety. And 16.4% seriously considered suicide. Now, the reason we wanted to highlight these stats is to really show the importance of taking care of your mental health and understanding that we all have mental health. How would you describe mental health and what words would you use to define it? So what is mental health? The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stressors of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to their community. It is more than the absence of mental disorders. Mental health is reflected in how we think, feel, and act. Good or positive mental health looks like a positive approach to life, feeling of balance, satisfaction, and effectiveness, and stressful events are experienced as challenges and not difficulties. However, a declining or poor mental health would look like changes in ability to cope with stressors, changes in mood, attitude, or physical health, and not necessarily a diagnosable mental illness. A person can, however, often function normally and may appear healthy to others. It's important to note someone's declining mental health and take steps to restore good mental health. And if someone is experiencing a decline in their mental health, it is not necessarily a mental illness. So now that we know what mental health is, what are mental illnesses? And how would you describe mental illness and how is it different or is it even different than mental health? We often see or hear the terms mental health and mental illness in everyday conversation. But what is the difference between them? Mental illness is characterized by changes in thinking, mood, or behavior, or a combination of the three, associated with substantial distress and general dysfunction. Everyone feels worried, anxious, sad, or stressed sometimes, but with a mental illness, these feelings are frequent or constant and interfere with daily life. Mental illnesses can make it harder to meet and keep friends, find and hold a job, or enjoy life. Mental illnesses aren't something we can diagnose in ourselves or others. They are formally diagnosed by mental health professionals. People who have diagnosable mental illnesses can live satisfying, fulfilling lives if they have right tools to support their wellness. A really good way of thinking about mental health is using this continuum. This is called the mental health dual continuum. A mental health dual continuum considers biological and psychosocial factors of mental health and well-being. It emphasizes that mental health and mental illness can coexist, such that individuals experiencing mental illness can thrive in our societies and post-secondary communities. The horizontal axis represents the presence of mental illness symptoms. The more right, the more symptoms a person is experiencing, and the more left, the person experiences less or no symptoms. The vertical axis represents how the person is doing with their mental health. 
the lower on this axis the person experiences poor mental health and well-being and the higher on this axis the person experiences positive or optimal mental health let's take a look at each of these quadrants the top left a person is experiencing a high level of mental health and well-being and has been diagnosed with a mental illness or has mental illness symptoms. We see that these people are practicing strategies to support their wellness and maintain their mental health. People who practice positive coping and take steps to address their mental health can see a reduction in mental illness symptoms and move more towards the right of the continuum. Top right, a person experiencing a high level of mental health and well-being but minimal or no mental illness symptoms. In this quote, we see people also practicing strategies to support their mental health and well-being. It's important to note that sometimes, regardless of your lifestyle choices, some people may develop mental illnesses. Many factors have an influence on whether people develop an illness, like genetics, environments, events, and stressors. But practicing positive mental health coping will support overall well-being regardless. Bottom right, a person experiencing a low level of mental health and well-being with minimal or no mental illness symptoms. These people may be struggling with motivation, may be neglecting self-care, and the stress may be adding up. If people continue to stay in this quad, they may start to develop mental illness symptoms. And lastly, the bottom left. A person experiencing a low level of mental health and well-being and has been diagnosed with a mental illness or has mental illness symptoms. These people are experiencing mental illness and are struggling with taking actions to support their well-being. There are various tools, resources, and apps that you can use to help understand your mental health sign and symptoms. Here at McEwen, we like to review the Mental Health Commission of Canada's Mental Health Continuum Tool. The Mental Health Continuum Tool recognizes the spectrum of all mental and physical health problems that may affect people during their lives. The continuum goes from healthy adaptive coping, which is the color green, through mild and self-limiting distress or functional impairment, which is yellow, to more severe persistent injury or impairment, which is orange, and clinical illnesses and disorders that need more intensive medical care, which are red. The arrow under the four color blocks highlights that mental health is a continuum one you can move back and forth on. Many people have physical and mental health problems that when identified and treated early can be temporary and reversible. Even if injured or ill, it's possible to return to health and function at a high level. Using the colors to talk about mental health helps prevent people from using a stigmatizing labels. It also helps diagnosing others which should be left to healthcare professionals. The Mental Health Continuum tool is a self-awareness tool that can help you understand changes to your mood, attitudes, behaviors, or physical changes, or in your use of substances and addictive behaviors. Everyone is different when it comes to experiencing poor mental health, and it is important to be aware of your own baseline and when you move from that baseline. One person might primarily struggle with physical and social functioning, whereas someone else might primarily experience thinking and emotional difficulties. This tool allows you to reflect on your signs and indicators of good, declining, and poor mental health and well-being. Think about your coping and your signs and indicators within each of these areas and use this tool to check in with yourself periodically to see how you're doing. Check in reflecting on the changes to your mood, attitudes, behaviors, or physical changes, or in your use of substances and addictive behaviors. To learn way more about this continuum tool, look for the Inquiring Mind workshop hosted by the Wellness and Psychological Services. It's a four-hour workshop all about mental health, coping, and creating a supportive campus environment for all. 
There are many things we can do to maintain good mental health or to try to improve it when we are struggling. Sometimes finding what works for us can take time, so it's important to be patient and compassionate with ourselves, especially in times of great stress and uncertainty. Self-care is extremely important and can play an important role in our overall wellness. Self-care is anything that we can do to support our wellness, such as brushing our teeth, sleeping for eight hours a night, eating nutritious food, going for walks, meditating, going for medical appointments, talking to friends and family, seeking support in times of need, and accessing resources. We are going to talk about just a few examples that many find useful. But to learn more self-care strategies, check out the Peer Health Education team site or visit us at our wellness events. Deep breathing is a slow, controlled breathing that helps reduce the stress response. Controlled breathing helps regulate your heart rate and reduce muscle tension and create a sense of relaxation. This is a good strategy to use during stressful situations or like exam time, if you're feeling a little nervous or if you're feeling stressed about a presentation that you have to do. So let's talk about why deep breathing works. The human body has two systems that control stress and calmness. The sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight system, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest system. These two systems cannot work at the same time. The fight or flight system speeds up your body functions, such as heart rate and breathing, and is responsible for the physiological symptoms of stress. Deep breathing stimulates the rest and digest system, which slows down body functions, such as heart rate, and reduces symptoms of stress. So when you deep breathe and control your breathing, it helps reduce the stress symptoms and settles your nerves. Note that deep breathing is most effective during stressful times if it is practiced on a regular basis, regardless if you're stressed or not. There are many different types of deep breathing exercises, but box breathing is an easy to remember technique that we like. Let's try this box breathing exercise. We will be breathing in for four counts, holding for four counts, breathing out for four counts, holding for four counts, and repeat. Let's follow the prompts here. Mindfulness is a type of meditation in which you focus on being intensely aware of what you're sensing and feeling in the moment without interpretation or judgment. Practicing mindfulness involves breathing methods, guided imagery, and other practices to relax the body and mind and help reduce the stress. Meditation has been studied in many clinical trials. The overall evidence supports the effectiveness of meditation for various conditions, including stress, anxiety, pain, depression, insomnia, high blood pressure, or hypertension. Meditation can help you experience thoughts and emotions with greater balance and acceptance. Meditation also has been shown to improve attention, decrease job burnout, improve sleep, improve diabetes control. A mindfulness exercise that's easy to remember is the three senses. A helpful mindfulness trick is simply to notice what you are experiencing right now through three senses, which are sound, sight, and touch. Take a few slow breaths and ask yourself, what are three things I can hear? For example, clock on the wall, car going by, music in the next room, my breath. What are three things I can see? Which could be this table, that sign, or a person that's walking by. And the third question is, what are three things I can feel? which it could be the chair under you, the floor under your feet, or the phone in your pocket. So think of these answers to yourself slowly, one sentence at a time. It's impossible to do this exercise and not be present and mindful. 
Social wellness focuses on building and nurturing meaningful and supportive relationships with individuals, groups, and communities. It enables you to create boundaries that encourage communication, trust, and conflict management. Social wellness also includes showing respect for others, oneself, and other cultures. Social connection can lower anxiety and depression, help us regulate our emotions, lead to higher self-esteem and empathy, and actually improve our immune systems. By neglecting our need to connect, we are putting our health at risk. Let's go over some of the resources that are available to you. Some of the on-campus resources are Wellness and Psychological Services, SAMU's Peer Support, Peer Health Education Team, SAMU Health Benefits Plan, Student Groups, KU Boston, Resident Services, McEwen International, and some of the community resources that are available to you are your family and your friends, doctor or other healthcare providers, your faith groups, community groups, Tune 111. Thank you for joining our workshop today. We hope that you learned some valuable tips and tricks. See you next time and good luck in your studies.